But can, wonderful. You can even wonderful. say something. <laughs> Well, thank you everybody for joining us uh, for our second panel on um, U.S. allies and, and intelligence. Um, since the Snowden revelations, there's been a lot of confusion as to the scope and breadth, obviously, of U.S. surveillance of its allies and their citizens. Spying on leaders, bulk data collection, and the idea the U.S. Sp is spying on the citizens of, of the world of various countries have all been melded into the perception that the U.S. is watching. Countries that have long considered themselves America's strategic allies are not just out of the loop in terms of intelligence, they now find themselves targets. And allies like Germany, who have fought themselves along tied U.S. troops in Iraq and Afghanistan, emerging powers such as Brazil, whose global partnership with Washington is growing, have learned some very hard truths, that there is very little loyalty when it comes into today's world of electronic surveillance. All of this has raised the question of what it means to be an American ally, and in the digital age, the answer is becoming very murky. So what are the rules of the road when it comes to spying among friends? Should there be rules? Is there an acceptable level of surveillance, and how should nations cooperate on security? What are the limits? You know, we have an excellent panel to discuss these issues. Um, Ambassador Wolfgang Ischinger is currently a distinguished scholar at the Wilson Center. Very lucky to have him back in Washington. He was the German ambassador to the UK from 2006 to 2008, uh, represented the EU in Troika negotiations on the future of Kosovo. We also remember him here as the German ambassador to the US from 98 to 2001. He served as a deputy foreign minister and is the chairman of the Munich Security Conference. Um, Sir David Ormond is a visiting professor at the War Studies Department of King's College in London, a former director of communications headquarters. Um, he served as the first UK and in security and intelligence coordinator responsible to the prime minister for the uh, health of the intelligence community, its national counterterrorism strategy, and homeland security. And Ambassador Tom Shannon was recently appointed counselor of the State Department by Secretary Kerry. Um, Ambassador Shannon uh, was serving before that as uh, ambassador to Brazil. I know he's very disappointed to uh, be away from that lovely country, but we're very glad to have him back. Um, ambassador Shannon is career ambassador in the senior foreign service, one of the only seven foreign service officers to hold the position of counselor since World War II. Uh, and the first in 32 years. So obviously a very distinguished panel. Um, I think we're gonna start off by talking about um, the real kind of in club when it comes to um, security um, and intelligence, and that's the Five Eyes Alliance, the US, Britain, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. Um, Sir David, why don't you kick us off by talking about what are the Five Eyes? People think it's just in the Snowden revelations, it's kind of been reduced to just a no spying pack, but it seems to be, you know, more than that. I think, I think you, you have, have to uh, remember, remember where this uh, uh, alliance came, came from. from. And, it and it started, started right back in 1916, 1916 when American troops landed in Europe, Europe. And, and there was cooperation on signals and intelligence. And then, and then in Again, during the Second World War, war this, this was revived, lots of people now know about the election time. And when, when the Cold War, war uh, started, the Korean War broke out. Again, we had, had this very close collaboration between the US and the UK and the uh, other uh, Five Eyes uh, partners. It's strongest in the area of signal intelligence, uh, particularly between the National Security Agency and then uh, the uh, signal intelligence agencies of the other five eyes. But it extends across into other areas of intelligence, human intelligence, imagery, and so on. And it's been the bedrock of allied uh, cooperation in intelligence throughout the long Cold War. And now in the fight against terrorism. Um, it's, it's not, not just the no spy agreement. In fact, that's, that's, that's not written into any, any formal agreement. Well, it's very, very close, close cooperation, cooperation on specific areas, such as counterterrorism. 
Well, it seems that, you know, even within that group, the U.S. and Britain intel relationship is the most important. And the U.S. really kind of the anchor here. It helped U.S. intelligence to thwart uh, U.K. intelligence to thwart a major attack. New Zealand has relied on it. Um, so really, the U.S. is really the bedrock of that, of that uh, group, wouldn't you say? Yes, yes and the specter of scale here, the, the US, U.S. intelligence effort is, is so much larger. larger. But, but it's, it's one, one of those arrangements where the sum of parts is so, so much greater, greater than, than the individual parts would be. be. The United, the United States, States is the world's, world's superpower, but even, even the United, United States doesn't, doesn't have access everywhere, doesn't, doesn't have a monopoly of clever mathematicians and cryptanalysts, and the, the very, very core act, act of cooperation of peer review of sharing um, means, means that the overall benefit is to the United, United States as well as, as to its partners. Um, just one last question. Uh, um, are, are we even hearing to it? I mean, is there a need to spy? Uh, this, these five countries um, generally know what's going on, but uh, with each other, I, I read somewhere that uh, we, because these five countries cooperate so closely, they don't have to know what's in their underwear drawers. But um, I mean, occasionally there are issues where they don't agree. And, and um, is there total trust among these five? I think you have to distinguish between the very close cooperation which there is at a technical level, for example, between cryptanalysts, the cooperation on hunting down targets such as terrorist groups, proliferation networks, criminal networks. Distinguish that from areas which are always going to be national prerogatives. Not everything is shared. The United States uh, and the United Kingdom do not, for example, talk about Israel in intelligence terms because that's a subject that is sensitive for the United States. During the uh, long, long campaign, campaign in Northern Ireland, Ireland we did not talk, talk about intelligence on the provisional IRA with the United, the United States, States because that's, that's sensitive, sensitive for us. us. So, so it's, it's not, not a complete, complete sharing, sharing, but it's, it's I think, the closest uh, that you will get anywhere in the world to a partnership between intelligence agencies. Cool. There have been some reports um, in the press that amplify that, that countries um, you know, might be spying on each other's citizens and sharing the info um, to get around these laws preventing governments from spying. Let me go to you, Tom. There are a number of surveillance partnerships. You have these five eyes. You have the nine eyes, which include uh, some of the European countries, of 14 eyes, of 41 eyes with the Afghan coalition countries. You know, and a lot has happened since this collaboration that Sir David talked about in, in World War II. You know, countries like Germany and France have equal, if not a greater intelligence relationship. Um, should there be, you know, other countries brought into this fold? Or, you know, should there not be these, these kind of clubs? It should just be more um, ad hoc and, and uh, kind of situational. Right. Well, first of all, thank you very much, and it's a tremendous pleasure to be here. Uh, I, I do want to highlight something that Sir David mentioned, uh, which is that Five Eyes is not about no spying agreements. Um, no intelligence agency, no serious intelligence agency would sign up for a no spying agreement. Um, Five Eyes is defined by cooperation, it's, and it's defined by uh, years of working together, and it's defined by the, the sharing of capabilities, as Sir David noted. Uh, that links and integrates key parts of uh, intelligence, uh, not just collection, but also analysis. Uh, and that's what makes uh, Five Eyes unique. And that's what makes uh, expanding or replicating Five Eyes challenging. Uh, first of all, because as he noted, we've been doing this since 1916, uh, across two world wars and, and one cold war. Uh, and in a world in which we've shared fundamental uh, political and commercial and economic interests. Uh, and so it has built a, a, a set of, of natural interests and convergence points that have made this uh, kind of cooperation easier. Also, as he noted, uh, because of complementary uh, mathematical, technical, and linguistic capabilities, uh, there has been a, a ready understanding of the uh, complementary nature uh, of, of this kind of activity. So as we look at uh, the diplomacy of the intelligence world, as we look at how you build out these kinds of relationships and structures, 
uh, we need to understand it really is about, is about sharing complementary uh, um, talents and abilities around common interests or purposes. Uh, and uh, we have seen a, a growth in, in the, uh, the, the cooperation and collaboration with many other partners, uh, especially around force protection issues uh, in Afghanistan and in Iraq. Uh, but also in our larger struggle against uh, jihadist groups and terrorist organizations intent on uh, attacking targets uh, among partner countries. In Syria too, I'm sure intelligence and, and, plays a And obviously part of it. Uh, recent events, whether it be the, uh, the Russian annexation of Crimea uh, and their intent not only in Ukraine uh, but beyond uh, the fighting in Syria and the concern about foreign fighters coming out of Syria. Uh, and the remaining concerns we have uh, in Afghanistan and, and elsewhere uh, have built levels of partnership that are important uh, and, and uh, not unique, but near unique. Uh, and whether it be with our, our European partners, with Germany, France, Spain, Italy, Norway, uh, Denmark, uh, and beyond, we've worked very hard uh, to, to build collaborative structures. But again, as Sir David noted, um, uh, these, are, these are like nodes that touch uh, because our nations are large and intelligence activities are only part of our, our, our larger uh, purpose in life and therefore there are moments when we disagree and disagree quite furiously uh, over issues. Uh, and it's at those points that nations are naturally interested in what each other are doing. Well, there are also countries where the relationship is quite close. Um, <laughs> particularly I would say maybe in some Middle Eastern countries, but intelligence is a, is a very sensitive matter and maybe the trust isn't there. Well, it's difficult for me to use the word trust in, in regard to international relations. You'd never find that word in Machiavelli. <laughs> <laughs> You'd never even find it in Harold Nicholson. Well, I would say in intelligence um, probably the um, Machiavellian really um, lies. Um, because we're talking about the relationships between nation states, obviously, and, and nation states, as noted, <laughs> that have a, a whole range of interests, some complementary, some, some not. Um, I think confidence might be a better word uh, because confidence has more to do with practice uh, and, and engagement. Um, and, and again, uh, there, we have very close intelligence partners in the Middle East, people with whom we work uh, on a daily basis to address very common concerns. Uh, but at the same time, because of geographic location and because of the, the location or the, the broader interests of, of these partners, uh, the, in a Venn diagram, the overlap of our common interests is not as great as they are with other countries. Um, Ambassador, in, sure. Add one, one additional, additional point, point to which, which, is which is that the Five Eyes uh, uh, arrangement is not, not exclusive. exclusive. And that's quite that's I think, has been well made. For example, the United Kingdom has very good and close intelligence relations, partnerships, really, with both the German services and with the French services. And in the case of Germany, the uh, uh, Signals Intelligence Organizations work hand in glove throughout the Cold War. Uh, and we have stations in Germany. That cooperation has continued today, particularly against, say, international proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. So it would be wrong to think of the Five Eyes as somehow being in opposition to other forms of arrangement. It just happens to be a little deeper than, because of its long history, uh, than the relationships we have with uh, other nations. Mm -hmm. Um, Ambassador, German Chancellor Merkel was at the White House last month, and after these revelations of you know, phone tapping of her and, and such, it, even after the discussions with President Obama, it seems that the differences are quite great in terms of the future intelligence relationship. They've been unable to reach agreement on uh, a broader intelligence sharing pact. Um, Germany wants the U.S. to cease spying from the embassy. Um, the U.S. can't give those ironclad assurances to Germany or any nation. How do you think this mistrust affects how the two countries are going to work on intelligence going forward, or at least in the, the short to medium term? Well, Elise, uh, thank you for that. A, that's a key question. And let me just say it's a pleasure to, even if he is uh, not here with us in the room, to uh, work with Sir David, whom I've known for many, many years, and of course also with Tom here. Um, 
let me step back a moment um, and, and try to explain what the difference is. Um, there are differences and there are similarities. We do have, between Germany and the United States, uh, a, a long history of s several decades of very close intelligence cooperation. Remember, we used to have the Soviet Union. Uh, Germany was the frontline country, uh, at least West Germany was. Uh, we had 350,000 Soviet troops in the other part of Germany. There was a lot of intelligence work that needed to be done together. Um, when I served as ambassador here in this town about a decade ago, uh, I was asked by my government to uh, arrange for a very uh, wonderful formal dinner with many dozens of guests from the entire U.S. intelligence community. And I was surprised how many different um, heads of intelligence organizations uh, uh, there, there are in Washington. Uh, the, the reason for this dinner was to honor Michael Hayden for the very close and fruitful cooperation that uh, our people had enjoyed with him while he served at NSA. So this is simply to say that we have also worked together well, benefited mutually from, from working together. But there is a big difference. As David and Tom have pointed out, the Five Eyes goes back to a successful um, winning team in World War II. You won a war together, you did things together, etc. The there, Germ are new, there are new wars and new alliances. The Germans were the ones who were defeated in World War II. Our intelligence operation at the end of World War II was completely eliminated. Out of zero was born a new intelligence uh, 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 organization, which, uh, let me put it colloquially, which was really, you know, a creation by the Americans, of the Americans, of the occupying power. They grabbed some of these people who knew lots about the Soviet Union and uh, put them together. In other words, um, our intelligence operation, as it, as it was first developed in the 1950s and later on, uh, always regarded itself as sort of like the son or the daughter of the United States. When you're the son of the daughter of somebody, you, f you are particularly offended if then at the end of the day you find out that your father or mother doesn't really trust you and actually spies on your on your cell phone. It is it is probably that, not surprising it though. It is that emotional thing that 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 creeps into this yeah. this debate. And 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 let me let me also point out to one other consequence of the fact that while you had the successful wartime coalition, we were def defeated country. It is. Uh, it would not be possible, I believe, in this country, nor would it be possible in the UK, uh, and I've served in both these countries, uh, for a former president or prime minister to say the kinds of things that former chancellors of Germany have said and continue to say about our intelligence services. I quote from memory Helmut Schmidt, who is now 95, who said, when I was chancellor, I never listened to these guys one, one time. I, I never even invited them into my office, speaking of the German intelligence service. In other words, a, 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 a lack, a relative lack of respect. Uh, there is no daily morning briefing for the German chancellor by the German intelligence community. The German intelligence community exists I, in my view, it does excellent work, but it does not enjoy the kind of um, popular respect, uh, sometimes even admiration. There are relatively few novels written about uh, <laughs> what the German intelligence service does as compared to 007 uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and the CIA, et cetera, et cetera. So these are all differences, these differences that matter when you think about why are the Germans getting so excited about the cell phone scandal 
uh, or the Snowden revelations. And it is true when you look at the polling data, Germans are more worried than anyone else uh, in Europe. Uh, not dramatically more worried, but significantly more worried and concerned about privacy issues, uh, about snooping, etc. Maybe one of the reasons is that we have, we have had a history in the 20th century of uh, a lot of lack of privacy and maybe too much intrusive uh, snooping by our own government. First we had the Nazis and then we had the Stasis. Um, and um, let me remind you that our current chancellor grew up uh, right. her entire first 20 years or so uh, of her life she grew up under Stasi rule. So the sensitivity and the mistrust of your own government may be a more developed phenomenon in my country than, than, than you would normally find it here or certainly in the UK. Well, how do you think that this uh, German-US dialogue planned later for this month in Berlin um, on intelligence um, will shake out. I mean, do you think there'll be some kind of accommodation between the U.S. and Germany? Well, I thought, I mean, I'm no longer uh, a government servant, so I can say what I think. I thought from, from the, <laughs> yes, and I do. Uh, I, I'm happy. Oh, I remember you did when you were ambassador. Uh, uh, I thought from the first moment on that the idea which was first uh, promoted of, of, of uh, you know, working out a German-U.S. no-spy agreement, I thought that was a pretty foolish idea that was not going to fly. Why? For one reason, because if the U.S. decided to sign such an agreement with us, uh, what would then the White House do if 27 other EU members would point. knock on the White House door and said, we want the same treatment as the U.S., and so on and so forth. So that didn't sound to me as a practical way of moving forward. I think this idea that we are now trying to develop, namely a kind of a track to uh, German-U.S. dialogue involving, maybe not immediately, but in the future, I hope, uh, senior members of, on both sides of, uh, of Parliament, of Congress here, of the Bundestag in Germany, experts, academics, uh, uh, specialists from the business community. I think that's a useful way mm -hmm. of calming the waters uh, slightly of explaining to each other what we're doing and why and exploring the question of are there rules of the road that we can work on not only to solve a German US problem but to uh, figure out the answers to some of the questions that were addressed in the first panel when Jane and, and, and David discussed the, uh, the questions that confront the US intelligence community and the US Congress at this moment. Tom. Talk about Brazil a little bit. Relations obviously a little bit frayed. Um, the President Rousseff uh, postponed her visit after the Snowden revelations about spying, um, um, conducting surveillance on her. And then Brazil's intelligence agency, um, the in uh, Institutional Security Cabinet, admitted it was conducting basic surveillance of diplomats and, and U.S. commercial property in the capital. You know, what about this idea that Everybody does it. I mean, sh is that true? And should there be a national security imperative or in this information age, is this um, just part of information as knowledge? Have we kind of got away from what classic intelligence really means? It's a great series of questions, uh, but before I uh, attempt to answer them, uh, let me just make a quick comment on what the ambassador said, which I thought were um, you know, very wise uh, words, uh, especially in regards you know, to our upcoming uh, cybersecurity uh, summit with uh, the government of, of Germany. Uh, we, we have a really good uh, intel to intel relationship, but even more broadly, a growing and very important cybersecurity relationship. And uh, independent of what chancellors might have thought, uh, Germany has a first-rate service, uh, and, and they're a very good partner. And one can imagine our relationship <laughs> deepening over time uh, to the point that it becomes five I like. Um, but, um, but in regard to, uh, to Brazil, Obviously, uh, uh, the Snowden revelations, you know, were uh, a terrible shock to the Brazilian system and to the bilateral relationship. And I had the pleasure of serving in Brazil at a time when my tenure began with WikiLeaks and ended with Snowden. <laughs> so, no uh, good deed uh, becomes uh, unpunished. Uh, kind Congratulations. Of, uh, kind of <laughs> vi vibrated between. That's the punishment for all those Kepra Heinas, yeah, Tom. Between two posts, uh, two posts which were quite. Um, 
uh, challenging, you know, in terms of, of our diplomacy. Uh, but uh, as I, I think has um, been shown with time, um, we've been working very hard to address it. Uh, and the Brazilians have been engaging with us, I think, in a very positive uh, and, and meaningful way. And this has allowed us to work with the Brazilians um, directly on the issues uh, related to the Snowden revelations, whether they be uh, resolutions uh, at UNESCO, revolutions in, uh, resolutions in the Second and Third Committee of the UN General Assembly, or in the Human Rights Commission, uh, related uh, to privacy uh, and the importance of privacy and the impact of surveillance uh, on, on privacy and, and other human rights. And the fact that, that we've been able to join consensus with Brazil and with Germany uh, on these resolutions, I think, uh, indicates that, that we've got a core set of interests uh, that are common and that, that we can work around. Uh, but also, uh, with time, there's, there's an, an increasing understanding that the kinds of assistance that we've been able to provide to Brazil in the run-up to the World Cup and that we will be able to provide in the run-up to the Olympics are going to be important, uh, especially as Brazil <laughs> tries to understand what kind of people are coming into its country uh, for these games. Uh, and in that sense, uh, the, the liaison, the intelligence liaison relationships that Brazil has built, not just with us, but many other intelligence services, are going to be key, uh, not only to its long-term security, but its ability to manage these events. And we're quite, we're quite confident uh, in that ability. And the fact that Vice President Biden is, is going down to Brazil uh, for the opening of the World <coughs> Cup to watch the U.S. team play and will meet with uh, President Rousseff, I, I consider to be a, a very positive sign. Uh, and obviously there's going to be plenty of room for continued dialogue, you know, especially around intelligence-related and security-related issues. I, I think we're, we're back on a positive track. Sir David, you know, all these revelations, Merkel, the pre President Yusuf, are embarrassing, but they're not related to the kind of mass surveillance that I think, um, you know, it rocked this country or, or bulk data collection. You know, the idea that everybody is involved in classic intelligence, quote unquote, spying, everybody does it. Are there foreign leaders we should be keeping an eye on? I mean, certainly with everything going on with Ukraine right now, intelligence on President Putin seems to be a pretty good idea. Well, the world is uh, still full of dictators, and there are very good policy uh, uh, issues that do need uh, intelligence. I think the I, Ambassador Issinger's comments, I thought, were very wise, and since I'm retired, let me also venture a, a comment on that, which is that these matters are much better dealt with behind closed diplomatic doors rather than in public diplomacy. One of the uh, things that should emerge from diplomatic discussion is confidence that amongst friends, there are proper processes in place to make sure that decisions are taken at the right level. Uh, when Stansfield Turner was director of the Central Intelligence Agency, he coined a wonderful test, which was never authorize an intelligence operation which you would be ashamed to stand up in public and defend were it to be revealed. Uh, that's the advice I've always given British ministers, never authorize something that if it all goes wrong, you will be ashamed of. And the Merkel operation clearly failed that test. And so one of the things I think that uh, the president in his statement, um, I think made very clear, is that the, the bar will be raised, uh, there will be proper consideration in the United Kingdom. All operations that could have a blowback on foreign affairs have to go personally to the Foreign Secretary, our Secretary of State. So I think we can work together to try, uh, as it were, and reassure each other that there are proper processes in place. Another area that we could do well to reassure each other is over the allegations of commercial espionage, uh, which, as again the US President uh, has made clear, uh, U.S. agencies are not authorized to collect intelligence for the commercial gain of U.S. companies, and the same applies in the U.K., but that is clearly not understood uh, across most of, of Europe. So in those sort of ways, I think uh, confidence can be built up. Just well, very briefly, on the question of what is alleged to be mass surveillance, 
here i think there is a huge misconception that snowden has helped to create between bulk access to data, digital data on the internet which all intelligence agencies are going to need in the future if they're ever going to find the communications of the terrorists and the criminals and the proliferators. Bulk access on the one hand and mass surveillance on the other. There is no mass surveillance conducted by the UK intelligence agencies of the UK or of anywhere else. Uh, it's, it is in fact targeted and carefully warranted but it does need that bulk access in order to find the traffic in today's digital world and that simple confusion I think has really helped to sour the atmosphere um, between uh, 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 the US and some of its partners. Um, Ambassador, let's, when he, uh, Sir David talks about, um, you know, the kind of digital age and, and we've been, you know, talking about the internet now, what about rulemaking efforts in Europe regarding data like the recent EU Court of Justice decision about the right to be forgotten? I mean, is it a fair, is, is it a fair request of citizens around the world to um, take unwant things that they are not wanted um, about themselves, that type of data off the internet? I think there is, whether one agrees with it or not, I think there's a growing, a growing, probably a growing majority view in, certainly in Germany and I believe in, in wider Europe, that the citizen should not only have something to say about how governments collect data, etc., that's the spying, uh, but also uh, citizens should have uh, the right to um, determine what companies can retain. That's the question that we're dealing with. That's it's going to have a lot of impact on these technology companies. That's the Google, that's the big Google question and that was the, uh, the ruling that just came down. I think what we're looking at in fact is, a, is, is an even larger problem. Um, the worst case that I believe could could happen, could easily happen, is that our business communities on both sides could be confronted with a situation where either they violate EU law or they violate US law. Mm. Let's say, for, I'll give you an example. Let's say the US law says you must not disclose to anyone that you need to give us, us the NSA, certain uh, information. Um, the EU law is likely to say, your company must disclose to your customer that you're the exact name and address to whom you are going to disclose whether you do it voluntarily or, or under legal uh, obligation, um, uh, my data. So I think that is a, a powerful argument in favor of some agreed rules of the road, at least in the transatlantic community. We don't want, I think it's not in the European interest to have Germany's, uh, to have companies like IBM, uh, you know, uh, being blamed. Uh, there was a case not long ago where a very large uh, international company in Europe uh, signed a contract with IBM to, uh, you know, to, 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 to service their servers. Uh, and it took exactly 48 hours until in the parliament of that country the government was asked the question is it okay uh, in terms of protecting the privacy uh, uh, rights of our citizens if this very large company allows data to be serviced by IBM because they are likely to end up you know in Washington DC or in Utah or somewhere in the, in, in, <laughs> at the NSA. Um, that is not good PR for IBM, I imagine. And I'm sure the, the alarm bell was ringing at IBM headquarters. Now, we don't want this kind of business conflict. There needs to be some, uh, some kind of uh, level playing field here where European law and US law somehow is coordinated in a way that we don't have a continuing uh, conflict. I think that's, 
uh, a very important job for governments and for the business communities on both sides to work together. Tom, what about that uh, in terms of from, from our pers uh, an American perspective? I mean, should the Internet be a safe space with everything kind of regulated and encrypted so that you can't monitor anything at all? I mean, is that the kind of world that we want? Uh, that kind of world won't exist um, because of the way in which the Internet functions uh, and the, the technological advances that take place, both to encrypt and to, to decrypt. Um, there is a, a certain common commonality or a, a common space about the Internet that is increasingly going to require people to understand that they are sacrificing aspects of their privacy just by entering into that, uh, uh, that area. I mean, they might be able to protect some specific aspects of it, but they're going to rely not on their own ability to protect, but on a company's ability to protect or on a government's ability to protect. Uh, with the knowledge that people will always be trying to break through those protections for, for their own purposes. Um, but the larger point the ambassador made is a very important one, which is the effort uh, between the United States and the European Union to begin to address issues of privacy, uh, what can be collected and what can't be collected, and how it's analyzed and used. And from my point of view, um, as important as uh, President Obama's January 17th spe speech was in terms of defining uh, the rules of the road and how we were going to conduct our signals intelligence going forward. Um, maybe the most historical component of what he did was ask his counselor, John Podesta, to begin a working group on big data and privacy to address the larger issue of big data and surveillance, not by governments, but by every form of data collection and emission that, and transmission that we have today. And whether it was the big data working group that he established, in which I was uh, honored enough to participate in, or whether it was the President's Council of Advi uh, Science and Te Technology Advisors, the conclusion reached is that collection is ubiquitous and that that cannot be stopped in a modern digital digitalized world. And therefore, we really need to focus on how it's analyzed and how it's used so it's not used in discriminatory fashion. And I think this is uh, um, going to require really new understandings of what privacy, uh, what privacy is. And this is where I think the United, uh, the United States and the European Union are beginning a very important and fruitful dialogue as, the, as the, uh, the most advanced economies in the world and the ones which have most digitalized and with populations that are the most connected. Uh, it is really here that we're going to be setting standards that are going to end up being standards uh, globally. Um, I'm going to ask Sir, D uh, Sir David to weigh in and then I'm going to open it up uh, to the audience. Yeah. yeah, I think there's one other consideration I think we should have in our minds, which is that we are now, as advanced economies, completely dependent on the Internet. Our companies are dependent on it, our markets are dependent upon it, and therefore the economic health of the future of the Internet and its future development is really what is most important. And the the governance of the Internet is what another of those very big issues. The future governance of the Internet is one of those big issues that I think the United States and the uh, European nations have to work together very closely with other partners around the world to find an answer. We know where the Chinese and the Russians and the Iranians would like to push this into a balkanization of the Internet. We know that would be fatal uh, for uh, globalization and for economic growth and for creativity, as well as putting their populations at further risk of repression. So the principles under which the governance of the internet uh, should be uh, run, I think, are going to be very important. One of those principles is that it must be commercially viable. And at the moment, it's only commercially viable because the uh, big internet companies, the Googles and so on, offer free services, search engines and all the rest of it by selling our data for marketing purposes. And that's how the economics of the internet works. I can't see an alternative to that. So I agree that we have to start rethinking um, what we mean by privacy uh, in the internet age. Another principle of governance for the internet is it must not be a lawless space. It mustn't be a wild west. Uh, we do need law and order. We need to deal with cyber hackers and 
criminals on the internet and the use of the internet by terrorists. So that does mean we have to find mechanisms which allow properly warranted and authorized uh, requests for information to be met by the international uh, and global internet companies wherever they are based. And that too is going to require some difficult negotiations between the United States uh, and Europe. Well, we covered a lot of ground from the Five Eyes to the Wild West on the internet. Um, I'm going to open it up to, uh, to questions from the audience. If you could um, state your name and affiliation um, and, and keep your questions brief, um, that would be great. If you want to signal to me that you have a question, um, we'll bring around uh, the microphones. Let's start um, in the back. My name is uh, Ed Duffy. I'm unaffiliated. Uh, I have a question for Sir David. Can you go into a little bit more detail about your uh, comment regarding to the fact that uh, the United States and Britain does not share information about Israel or the IRA? Does that imply uh, that the uh, uh, the United States is too pro-Irish, or Britain is anti-Israel? <laughs> uh, very happy to give a brief, brief reply to that. On Israel, it's uh, the uh, essentially political sensitivity on the U.S. side. But that's a subject that, uh, uh, and there have been some recent controversy over it, so you'll know what I mean when I say that's a subject that uh, the U.S. administration believes is a national U.S. Uh, matter and not one uh, to be shared uh, with us. The uh, uh, provisional IRA were, to a large extent, funded by uh, uh, Boston Irish. So uh, it was, again, uh, an issue of some considerable sensitivity for the U.K. and for the U.S., and it was just agreed that uh, that's something the U.S. would not expect to know what uh, detailed intelligence the United Kingdom was uh, gathering on the terrorists on both sides of the Irish uh, uh, conflict. Thankfully, that conflict is now over, and we have a peace process which to, for which we owe quite a lot to the United States for the diplomatic effort they put in uh, to help bring the sides together. Um, I'm going to take you back to the Israel example, and not to get too much into politics, but for instance, um, I know that the U.S. was very concerned, for instance, about EU plans to um, boycott um, Israeli settlements because of, um, you know, this divestment campaign um, with the Palestinians, or certain sanctions that they were going to um, pass um, in response to Israel's treatment of the Palestinians. And so this, I would think, would be an instance where, you know, this kind of uh, fine line between intelligence for national security purposes and the kind of, you know, information that we need to know as, as the U.S. is making its policy decisions. And I think this is where maybe the U.S. kind of lost its way in terms of the fine line between um, kind of need to know intelligence and I need some reconnaissance on that. Sir David. Well, it is a fine line. Uh, I mean, my definition of intelligence, uh, you know, relates very directly to the improvement of decision making by reducing ignorance, and that which is the shortest definition I can think of for intelligence. And secret intelligence is just that tiny little part of that uh, to do with information that other people don't want you to have. And most of the information that you need for good policy making, you can obtain perfectly openly, and particularly now through the, uh, the digital revolution, there is a great deal of information around. But there is a very small amount that people obstinately still try to keep from you. Uh, just think of the position in, in Syria or President Putin's uh, motivations towards the annexation of Crimea, and you'll know what I mean. Or Tom, let, let's take it to like the BRICS, for instance. You know, when they meet on these uh, on the, on the sidelines of of other meetings, um, uh, Brazil, Russia, China, and India, talking about you know economic policies that would be 
you know, important to the U.S. and they would want to know what these countries are talking about. I mean, is that a an acceptable level of surveillance intelligence, or is that something that you know have we lost our way in terms of what qualifies as quote unquote intelligence, and is this something that should be done more through diplomatic channels? Well, um, I won't talk. Not about to put that. you on the spot yeah, or anything. Um, <laughs> uh, with with all due respect, I won't take up the example. Okay. Um, but, uh, uh, but, but obviously, uh, uh, there's lots of information, as Sir David noted, which is available publicly. And there's lots of information uh, that can be uh, achieved uh, through engagement, uh, normal diplomatic engagement uh, and, and otherwise. Um, but there remains, and will remain, probably for the rest of time, uh, information that is either guarded or uh, kept very closely uh, because it identifies motivations or purposes or means uh, that the holder of the information does not want anybody else to know about, uh, but which could be very important to how we understand the purposes uh, of uh, an interlocutor, uh, and that would be useful for us to have. As Sir David noted, it helps us uh, ensure that we make the right decisions as, as opposed uh, to, to the wrong decisions. Uh, this is obviously true uh, in uh, the area of uh, national security, especially in regard to, to terrorist organizations. Um, but quite frankly, it, it can also help countries uh, understand the, the purposes uh, of nations that are not always transparent uh, and will ensure that we not, don't overreact. Uh, to certain kinds of behavior or don't underestimate uh, certain kinds of behavior. And in this regard, uh, I, I think that uh, espionage, whether it be signals intelligence or human intelligence or image intelligence, is, is going to continue to play a very important role. And give, let me give you just one example where it's going to increasingly play a key role in preserving peace. And that is in the area of nonproliferation and it's in the area of especially backing up certain kinds of nonproliferation agreements. Um, without the kind of intelligence we, we obtain through, through signals intelligence and especially through image intelligence, uh, our ability to track compliance with certain kinds of arms control treaties and nonproliferation regimes is almost impossible. Uh, but this is an area in which our ability to, to have access to that information uh, allows us to gauge and understand who is violating agreements and who is not. Any more questions here, here in the front, right here? And then we'll go to this gentleman right here. I'm George Sonobok. I'm, I'm at the New York University School of Law. I used to work in Amsterdam in the Institute for Information Law. So I have a bit of a European uh, perspective as well. So my question actually is to add a little bit to the complexity of the international dimensions here is that there are a bunch of court cases ongoing and actually today it was announced in the German Parliament that the federal prosecutors have opened the case against uh, uh, in, like investigating the spying of the NSA uh, that, uh, that happened in, uh, with respect to uh, Angela Merkel. Yeah. And uh, so I wonder what, uh, what, what you think uh, of, of this dimension that there are actually courts that are now considering these, these programs and, and also like seeing some recent court rulings, especially from the European Court of Justice, uh, that like, in, in a March ruling struck down the data retention directive, uh, with the references also kind of, it seems like inspired by the Snowden revelations, if it could be that actually the, the judicial branch is going to, in the end, maybe in, in a little bit more time, because court cases take a lot of time, uh, is going to have a significant impact on, uh, on the debate in the longer run. Ambassador, you want to take that one? You, you are right. Uh, a decision was announced, I think, overnight, yesterday or this morning, that the attorney general, the prosecutor general in Berlin, was going to open a formal investigation into the cell phone uh, affair. Um, but that's not the only thing. We have a formal parliamentary investigation committee already established, which is pondering Unfortunately, from my point of view, the question of whether they should invite Mr. Snowden to testify, uh, I hope uh, wisdom will prevail and they will not uh, want to do that. It doesn't seem like the chancellor supports that. 
I Excuse do. me? It doesn't seem like the Chancellor of supports this. Of course, the thing. Chancellor does not support this, but uh, uh, parliamentary in the investigation committees under our uh, regulations uh, have their own lives and their own uh, decisions, etc., etc. So this is um, not good <laughs> from, the point, from the point of view of having a healthy and trusting transatlantic relationship as we look at uh, you know what's going on in Ukraine how we deal with the Iranian crisis what about the Middle East etc cetera, etc cetera. this distracts from uh, major common foreign policy objectives and i think i can only refer back to david's point uh, when he let me call it the embarrassment factor if you believe that whatever you're going to authorize w once revealed uh, is going to embarrass you significantly, you know, it's probably better not to do it. Um, we had a case, uh, I just want to uh, uh, present that as, as an example, uh, how far countries uh, are likely to go and, and, and embarrassing themselves. Um, in the 1970s, when we had a chancellor in Germany by the name of Willy Brandt, a, a, a person known the world over, the GDR managed to smuggle uh, a sleeper spy into his personal entourage. And this gentleman by the name of Guillaume became a, uh, uh, essentially a, um, a personal assistant to the chancellor. When that blew open, um, Chancellor uh, uh, Brandt resigned. That was the end of his career. Was this embarrassing to the GDR? Sure it was. Uh, th did the GDR believe that they had done the right thing? Sure they did. Because for them, uh, getting rid of Willy Brandt was probably seen as a good thing. So f from their point of view, that was actually a successful intelligence operation, I imagine. But um, that's how far uh, uh, people uh, take this. Just one final remark. I want you not to think here only in terms of, you know, personal, uh, emotional uh, anger or disaffection, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this is a serious issue. Um, I have, you know, I'm a, um, I'm a long-time Atlanticist. I've served in various positions over the last 35 years, um, several times in this country and, 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 and elsewhere. And I know how important trust, not so much between the two leaders is, but how, how important trust between nations, between peoples, is when it comes to um, creating coalitions, creating a, a, a common objective. We are currently facing very difficult challenges vis-a-vis -vis, uh, in the question of how to handle Russia, how to deal with President Putin, how to work with Ukraine, et cetera, et cetera. Needless to say, this is a huge new challenge. In Germany, it is not easy for Chancellor Merkel at this moment to be seen as working very closely with President Obama because there is this suspicion, you know, out there, uh, hard to grasp, that maybe the Americans, these are the Americans who spied on her cell phone, maybe they are only trying to drag us into a new kind of Cold War. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's this l loss or lack of public trust that makes working together between governments harder than it should be. It is actually a burden on, 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 on doing the right thing in terms of foreign policy. Fortunately, Germany has a very strong 80% uh, uh, majority coalition at the moment, so this is not, not a serious risk. But believe me, if, if Chancellor Merkel only had three or five votes majority in the Bundestag, it, it could be a serious problem. So that is how these issues of surveillance and trust are not only problems for internet geeks and, and, and intelligence specialists, they do have implications for the larger strategic 
uh, Western uh, objectives. That's why we're here. It's important. Okay. Um, uh, we have two more questions. I'm going to ask uh, three. I'm going to ask to take them all at once, and then we're going to ask the panel to um, address them and, and make some closing remarks. We have about 10 minutes. Um, let's start in the back right there, and then we'll work our way to this gentleman here, and we'll, we'll take them all. Uh, Quick Steve, questions, please. Right. Steve Winters, Washington based researcher. I'd like to address this to Ambassador Ishinor. Uh, if it weren't for the negative consequences having Snowden testify in Germany would have for the relationship with the U.S. and displeasing the U.S. government, are there any internal reasons that you would oppose Snowden being invited to testify as an expert witness in Germany, purely aside from the U.S. question? Okay. This, this woman right here, very brief, please. Uh, Voice of America, Fatima Tlis. My question is about the balkanization of uh, Internet and particularly Russia. How, uh, what will be the consequences of, for the people in that country? Okay. In that Russia? Happens. Yes, in Russia. Okay. And um, gentleman right here. Uh, <coughs> sorry. I'm Rafael Grimendi, and I'm an economist in Latin America, Portugal, and Spain. My question is for Ambassador Shannon, since he was a U.S. ambassador in Brazil. From the economic perspective, obviously Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa may have a good perspective in the future. However, if they don't, they are not related to the European Union as well as to the U.S. That uh, economic group could probably will not progress. And then right now we have a problem, terrible problem with Russia. So how do you perceive the Russian phenomenon in this economic group? Okay, um, Sir David, why don't you start um, with the um, consequences of this balkanization? The ambassador um, will talk about um, Snowden, and then and then we'll finish up with Tom. Sir David, I think my starting point on this is that the the internet is a global phenomenon, and countries will get the greatest advantage, both social and economic, from treating it as a global asset. It's a global commons. If countries do try and uh, develop their own internets that, and their own clouds and essentially try and nationalize the control of uh, their population's access to the internet. So every time you try to uh, look something up, you're directed to a government-censored website which will then only give you part of the answer, you block access to uh, uh, foreign broadcasting on the, on the internet and so on. The losers will be the population of that country, both socially and economically. And I do fear that some of the ideas which have come up for greater state control of the internet are designed to uh, essentially for repressive purposes. Um, Tom, why don't you, you uh, take that um, gentleman's question and, and build on that, and then we'll, then we'll finish with uh, the ambassador. Yeah. Uh, br briefly on, on the BRICS, um, uh, obviously uh, Brazil has exploited uh, BRICS uh, very intelligently uh, and presented itself to the world uh, as equal to China, uh, equal to India, and equal to Russia uh, in terms of importance, both economically and, and politically. And they're to be congratulated for using a Goldman Sachs uh, <laughs> structure uh, uh, as a, uh, a diplomatic elevator, essentially, um, and to to accomplish something in a short period of time that would have taken a very long period of time to to assert. Going to use um, that one. But um, uh, but but uh, but what's striking is uh, because of the very di the distinct and and uh, nature of the political systems and the, the differences that exist between China, Russia. Uh, India, Brazil, and South Africa, uh, the BRICS uh, largely talks about global economy and economic issues. They really cannot address political issues in a meaningful way. Uh, and for that reason, Brazil, uh, along with India and South Africa, created IBSA, 
because these three countries are democracies. These, these three countries are committed to human rights. And these three countries have a very different uh, profile in the world than uh, the other BRIC countries. Uh, so um, uh, Brazil has an economy of size that's going to continue to be of interest, uh, independent of who it relates to. Um, but obviously, uh, in regard to Russia, in regard to Crimea, we would have hoped for a, um, uh, a, a clearer Brazilian response uh, to what was uh, an obvious act of um, raping, plunder, and pillage uh, in Ukraine by Russia. It doesn't sound like, from what you're saying, though, that, like, for instance, that these re that there's could ever be any kind of like tight intelligence relationship among that little club because they differ on so many issues. Well, also the nature of the intelligence services are so distinct. I mean, the Russians and the Chinese would swallow the others whole. Um, good point, um, Ambassador. Why don't you finish up um, on uh, Snowden? Would you oppose it under any other means if it wasn't? so offensive to the U.S. and any um, closing thoughts? I would oppose it, and I'll tell you why. Uh, we have had a tendency in my country to treat these, uh, they be called the Snowden revelations, uh, etc., as if it were a German-American bilateral problem. It is not a German-American bilateral problem. It is a global problem for the United States or is it a global problem for all of the intelligence community or for the, the, uh, for the entire internet world. In other words, I would oppose uh, creating a situation that would intensify the impression in Germany that we are uh, having a kind of a private war with the United States here. That's not what it's all about. So I'm not interested in having Mr. Snowden, even if no one in the U.S. cared about it. But I know that people would care a lot, and that makes it, from my point of view, absolutely uh, mandatory that we um, tell Mr. Snowden if he wants to do that, he should go back to his own country, which is this country, but not come to Germany. Okay, well, um, thank you so much to my panelists, Ambassador uh, Wolfgang Ischinger, Sir David Ormond, and Tom Shannon. A lot of food for thought. Um, thank you. I just want to remind everybody that there will be lunch served in the room across, so um, please feel free to partake in that and enjoy the rest of the day. And